ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second webinar session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second webinar session. Organized by the Philippine Society for Ecology. True to its vision, the Society is continuously providing relevant training and certification activities. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second webinar session organized by the Philippine Society for Quality. True to its vision, the Society is continuously providing relevant training and certification activities, which are responsive to the needs of the industries. Today's session will focus on digitization and innovation in creative education. I'm humbled to present to you our resource speaker for today, he is the director of the Center for Research, Innovation, and Development at St. Paul University. He is a developer of an, of an online series of seminars on research and on other topics that bridge senior high school education to adult lifelong education. Dr. Brian said, I am an artist first, an educator second, and a researcher third. If I had the time and the money, I would consider becoming a natural Pathic doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our resource speaker, Dr. Brian S. Bantugan. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me here at PSQ. Should I start my presentation now? Yes. Shall I share my screen now? Is it okay? Okay, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The, the... Okay, thank you. Let me just... Uh... Okay, wait a while. find my PowerPoint. Wait lang po ha. Okay. Share. All right. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Bantugan. I'm the director of the Center for Research, Innovation, and Development of St. Paul University, Manila. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about digitization and innovation in creative education. Uh, this is something that we are planning to offer as a certificate in St. Paul. Uh, however, so um, this presentation is going to be an overview of what it is about. And I hope that we can uh, share with you the ideas that we will carry in our certificate program. So uh, just a disclaimer, this is not a how-to. This is a perspective-taking opportunity. Because when we talk about um, creativity and innovation and... Uh, digitization these are very loaded words so i want to really focus on what we mean at least where we are not saint paul and how we take these terminologies to heart uh, how we develop our content based on how we understand these terms so just uh, a brief back background of um, where i came from so i'm i'm a solid up graduate no from undergrad to my ma to my uh, phd i took it from UP Diliman. But the thing is, it took me a long time no, in my undergrad because I was in engineering first. So you will see in the pictures on the slide, there's a college of engineering there. Uh, after five semesters, I decided it wasn't for me. So I went to the College of Fine Arts. And then after working for a year and uh, 
figuring out what I really wanted to do after my work. I went to the College of Mascom, and then that's where I also uh, finished my uh, uh, PhD. Uh, there's a picture of the College of Arts and Letters, the old one, the one that caught fire, because um, while I was in my undergrad, I was also doing a lot of things like theater in the College of Arts and Letters no, on a freelance um, situation. Uh, also, as a speaker, you also need to know the other side of me, outside of the academe. I've been very much oriented towards uh, community work, and I have to more or less uh, credit Ateneo for that because um, I was a very active uh, youth member in the parish and our, our pastor at that time, our parish priest was a Jesuit. So um, after my um, engagement in that parish, I saw myself going to Sapangpalay for the rural poor. I also went to Bukidnon. I had some volunteer work in Philippine Orthopedic Center so I learned a lot from that. And during the 1995 World Youth Day, I was actually uh, one of the organizers in our parish, you know, mobilizing a lot of the young people. So you will see, you know, I'll, I'd like to go back to the previous slide. I'm a mix of so many things. I came from the, the positivist sciences. I went to the humanities, the opposite side. Hi, and then Dr. I went Brian. To, yes, yes. Dr. Brian, you're, I think you're present is frozen can you frozen so what do you see on your uh what do you see on your screen what do you see on your screen Wala. at the moment just the two of us <laughs> okay now do you see it do you see it now i think it's not moving sir we can yeah can you try it again do you see a slide here? Do you see a slide? We can see it now, uh, okay. Dr. Brian. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is there a way that you can put it on um, slideshow or presentation? Yeah, um, it's on slideshow right. now. Sorry, kindly press oh. the show. You can press it's slideshow. On slideshow. Oh, on, it's not on our end, Dr. Brian. Um, um i don't know but it's on slideshow from my end so i don't okay. know what. okay that let me continue if that's right. okay uh -huh. there is it on slideshow now um no i think it's still it's still loading huh dr brian um please try to reshare okay do you see it uh, move to another slide? No? no. Earlier, it wasn't moving. <laughs> it's just on the front page. And then the second one, it was on the, I think, on the fourth page so, or fourth slide. So now do you see the PowerPoint without the slideshow? Um, I don't see anything right now, Dr. Brian. Can you reshare the, the slide? I mean, the, the PowerPoint? Sure, sure. Now it's sharing. Do you see anything? Uh, okay. I can see it now. Okay. So sh shall I keep it this way? Because uh, you don't see any slideshow. Yeah, that's okay. Um, okay. There, I think that's better. <laughs> okay. Way better. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I, I was saying earlier that in my academic background, I'm a mix of different things. So I'm in the engineering side, I'm in the fine art side, I'm in the social science side. But uh, outside of that, I had pastoral experience. So I had a lot of service oriented activities, which sort of informed the way I uh, decided on certain things while uh, I was at work. Okay. Uh, also, you should know that there are things that are um, sort of informing the way I do things. Like I've been to Kulyon, so uh, things happen to me there. UP played a big role in my life. Uh, I like um, I like riding trains. Uh, it's a very uh, therapeutic uh, activity for me. And also, I like secondhand bookshops. 
So why am I saying all of these things? Uh, a lot of the innovation that happens no, uh, are actually provided for by people who go through many different kinds of experiences. And creativity is defined by uh, the, the putting together of seemingly two disparate things that don't seem to belong. But when you put them together, a new thing comes out. So I think uh, you should know that I come from different backgrounds and I'm not strictly from the technical field. I'm also in the very creative field and that creates a uh, magic, I think, at least from where I see it. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with the uh, two terms. So it's technological determinism and cultural determinism. Um, I think these two terms are very important because nowadays, when somebody talks to you about creativity and digitization, um, the perspective is always the technological determinism. No, um, when when I say that, they always think that it's a lot create a lot more creative now because we have a lot more technology that allows for creativity. No, uh, so it's it's very much informed by technological determinism. The driver of creativity is really technology. On the other hand, there's such a thing as cultural determinism. Meaning, um, if you see a lot of creativity, you know, outside or wherever you go, it's always a product of people coming together and deciding that they should produce something new. So culture is leveraged in this particular perspective. So when we try to understand um, creativity or digitization or innovation, what frame do we use? Are we going to just use the popular one that a lot of the developers of technology are using? trying to drive the economy through technology? Or are we going to use the perspective of the cultural communities, the creative communities? No? Uh, so what frame do we use? What agency do we privilege no, in our uh, understanding of that, uh, the topic for today? So uh, I'm sure you've heard about, about the smart city, and a lot of people say it's only a matter of time. But I think if you think about the the argument, no, it's only a matter of time. There's not a lot of creativity there. We're just waiting and sitting and watching things happen, no? So I think uh, that's not very enabling for me. Uh, and, and then you also see Black Lives Matter, and some people say it's time. So it's time insofar as people decide to come together and, you know, speak out their minds and try to achieve some change. So in this particular case, when there people are not sitting, no, they're standing, they're rising together, and they're letting their voices heard. So that's a different kind of uh, view of uh, change. Now uh, I'd like to propose a no, question: Who chooses? If we're looking at digitization, who who makes the choices here? In uh, do we see do we see people who are actively involved in their learning choosing? No, what technology they use. Or do we have uh, companies who are in the technology sector who are telling people what to use and what not to use? So essentially, uh, what I'm saying is, uh, is this digitization uh, era uh, driven a lot more by the choices people make? Or are these choices driven a lot more by companies who are pushing forward technologies that are being sold to the market? So uh, let's... Uh, come forward with uh, two things. No? Initially, when we think about technology, um, we, we think about the mass media, communication technology, we think about mass com. But let's go back now. When we think about the radio, initially, the, the plan was to use it for warfare, you know, espionage. Um, but then when it became more mainstream, it became radio where we hear music, we hear people talk. You know? So later on, we see that uh, a specific technology designed for warfare given to the people is transformed. So you have you have cultures trying to shape technology that was initially designed for something else. Uh, when we talk about computerization, initially the the idea was to compute, to do a lot a lot of math uh, com computations. No, so uh, when it was uh, when it was uh, something that became more accessible to people then the value of computers became not so much computation, at least for the mainstream who use uh, computers, but really word processing that involves printing and editing and creating and saving. So the purpose was sort of redirected towards something else. 
right? And then let's talk about digitization, no? And we're not only looking at computers now, we're looking at the computerization of everything around us. So digitization allowed many different um, uh, gadgets to talk to each other, different people to talk to each other. So um, the, the beginnings of the internet was really uh, from a military uh, purpose, no? espionage, surveillance. But then when it became more popular, it, was, it became social media. So internet has become synonymous to Facebook or uh, Instagram or email or information uh, searches, not really uh, anything related to militarization. So the question is who wins all the time, no? So you see all these cases uh, and you see there's a lot of um, mechanization and computerization and digitization, but essentially at the end of the day, who shapes these things, no? Is it technology per se, or are people actually transforming existing technology to suit their needs? So uh, when, we th when we say machines determine the future of uh, creativity, maybe we're being predictable and being predictable is really not being very creative so i'd, I'd like to challenge so no? maybe uh a lot of people will say maybe things will change maybe the machine will win this time no very very terminator no perspective but i i doubt i doubt if that will happen no because ultimately the one who creates the technology are human beings so who will make them make them win if they will win it's still us so they will it will be us. So going back to the issue of technological determinism and cultural determinism, uh, seemingly, at least from my side, I think it's a lot better for us to look at the issue of uh, digitization and innovation, creative education from the cultural lens, right? So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the fourth industrial revolution. You know, the, the theory here is that the first... Uh, industrial revolution um, evolved into a new one, into a new one, and then the fourth one being uh, the cyber physical systems. No? Um, uh, but if you think about how this uh, idea of the industrial, re industrial revolutions came out, this was not planned out at the beginning of the industrial revolution. The titles given to these phases no, in the development of technology was actually a result of a review of what transpired in particular periods in time. So uh, when we think about the fourth industrial revolution, it seems to be like a natural progression from the third, you know, where instead of just electronic technology, we're now moving into cyber physical systems. And that said, parang, you know, there's nothing really to decide on. It's uh, just uh, something that will naturally happen given the technologies of the third industrial revolution but i tell you no um the beginnings of the fourth industrial industrial revolution is actually a setup it's a setup meaning uh it's not as if it's a natural uh development in our lives no it's it's something that was built throughout the years and uh compared to what happened no from the third to the first industrial revolution uh, which was essentially a review the fourth industrial revolution and onwards will be something of a plan no it's not a review label no it's a it's a set up uh, towards the future and uh the fourth industrial revolution like the first the second the third uh are it's it's just a human construct no uh the the first second and third industrial revolution their their labels their codes given by people who did research no in retrospect uh, and as such no building on the the labels and the codes we have the fourth industrial revolution so the fourth industrial revolution it is not just a development in technology it's also an agenda no uh, a lot of people are are trying to push for it because there's a lot of economics involved there's also a lot of politics involved there it's also a way of understanding the kind of development we want not towards the future so it's also a frame we use to sort of integrate everything we want to do no, for the future. Okay, so um, now we're moving into the concept of the revolution. No, uh, Historically, we've seen the Bolshevik revolution, we've seen the Cultural Revolution of China, we've seen the Pol Pot Revolution no, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, there are things that have happened and they were called revolution and 
putting all these revolutions together it doesn't really give us a positive picture of what the revolution is no but ultimately if we consider these three images these are politico cultural revolutions with an economic turn no economic meaning there there were economic repercussions uh and turn turnabouts no? or turnarounds no uh, as a result of the politico cultural revolution that happened of course, EDSA is another one. It's still a debate whether it was really a revolution. But this is one type of revolution where powers that be take hold of the population and co-opt the population to turn things around. So there is an active mobility of people. So you can say there's agency here. Uh, the level of agency must be still um, sort of resolved. Okay. Now, there's another kind of revolution we see. No, This is the Earth revolving around the sun. And it seems like this is the more natural uh, meaning of a revolution. Now, when we think about the fourth industrial revolution, is this going to be a revolution that's inevitable, like the, the moving of the, of the Earth around the sun? Or is it going to be a revolution that's brought about by human agency? No, uh, Is it a force of nature where we can't do anything about it? Or is it human agency where... It's nothing but our doing as human beings, no? Where where do we place our understanding of the fourth industrial revolution? Is it really inevitable or is it something we can still shape, no? Considering where we are right now in terms of the kind of te technology that's accessible to all of us. So now, uh, if you think about it, when you argue that it's a force of nature, it's not quite creative. But if you think about the fourth industrial revolution as a result of human agency, there's a lot of creativity involved there. There's a lot of human power involved. And if you go back to the two concepts that I presented earlier, so looking at it as a natural phenomenon, maybe it's more technological determinism and human agency is more cultural determinism. So when we talk about digitization, we can talk about it from the technological standpoint, we can also talk about it from the cultural standpoint. So we make a decision. No, it's not as if it's made for us. Remember, if you want to be creative, we take we take a step, we assert our power, and we our, our power should determine the way we tell the story. So is it going to be how the military use the internet to monitor all of us? Or is it going to be us taking over the technology to use it for the kind of purposes that we want no? to make our lives more meaningful? So whose uh, story are we telling? What are we privileging no? in answering the question of digitization? So, uh, but for me, it's not really a question, but a challenge. No? These are two things that have happened before. It's actually present happening. No? Uh, the military is using it to look at all of us. No? And we are also using it for our own uh, purposes. So these are two things that are happening. What particular picture do you want to be prominent? No? So uh, so we have to acknowledge our agency to be creative. Without a sense of agency, there's going to be fear. There's going to be anxiety. There's going to be submission and dependence and addiction. And we're seeing a lot of that in Facebook. We're seeing a lot of dependence on technology in the online classes. There seems to be no other way to do it. And that's a really sad picture that we're seeing right now. So no culture of creativity can exist without this sense of human agency. So I'd like to challenge the way we are trying to deal with technology at this point. While we see that we seem to be helpless, I think there's going to be room for us to always assert our power over technology. And that's the only way we will do it. Otherwise, we'll be slaves to the technology. And I'm saying this only insofar as we want our education to be empowering, no, not... Uh, not a system where people are put in a relation, a de dependency relationship with technology. So I'll, I'll put forward cultural determinism. So it leads to creativity, it leads to innovation, it leads to genuine education, it leads to change. So I'm really pushing forward the idea of culture that should drive our creativity, you know, especially in the educational sector. Now, um, I'm I'm a I'm a, an ethnographer no, by practice. I've had uh, a background in anthropology. And I've, I've said to some of my colleagues that there are many ways to look at culture. You can look at culture as a construction of humans. You can look at culture as constructing humans. Or you can look at culture as enslaving humans within a seemingly unchangeable structure. 
So these two, we have to choose from, no? Uh, we're not bound to any of these three. So it's still a matter of choice for all of us. So I go back to where I was. So while I studied in UP, I'm not a slave of UP. I'm not uh, bound to the ideologies that I learned there. I'm not bound to my education. I'm free to make something different out of my givens. I'm free to tear myself apart to be something new. So through education enables self-change. So if we really have education, we need to have that education uh, enable uh, our students or graduates to make decisions counter to the institution itself. So um, we shouldn't be uh, asking our students to just replicate what we've given them. No, uh, Empowerment means we're allowing our students to really make choices, even if those choices may be contradictory to what we taught them. That's that's a kind of empowerment that education has to give. You know? uh, and also, uh, knowing that I have been committed to a lot of community work you know, in the past, I can still say I'm not bound to any, any responsibility. I'm still a free person. So I'm free to act in any way coherent with my principles and to see beyond all forms of service. So if, if this particular way of service is no longer in conformity with the way I live, that I have to find a creative way to do it in such a way that it's more coherent with the, the, the life that I live right now. So for me, being a constructivist, no, I don't believe in technological determinism. I don't believe that there is an inevitable revolution. I don't believe in artificial intelligence. Of course, artificial intelligence is here, but whether artificial intelligence will direct no, the future for us, I don't think that's something I, I believe in. And all of these beliefs are actually very structuralist. And uh, the belief system of structural, structuralism is really anchored on the idea that we're all, we're all bound to a structure. No? Culture is a structure. Technology is, a, uh, is the means by which culture actually um, bounds us. No? to its very own structure. So I believe that people actively, actively construct or make their own knowledge and that reality is determined by your experience as a learner. Uh, basically, learners use their previous knowledge as a foundation and build on it uh, with new things that they learn. So it's a very transformative uh, principle that I hold on to. So um, definitely when we think about creative education in the age of digitization and innovation, um, what I mean is that we're allowing uh, culture to take hold of technology, digitization in particular, so that it can help transform people first, you know, and using technology to transform people even more. So human agency is the conduit of the uh, culture, technology, and education. Um, the intersections of all these three aspects are actually um, melded into the the idea of human agency so i'm generally a constructivist and then um hum, human agency is creativity you know uh, the capacity to imagine al an alternative future and to mobilize towards its fulfillment is creativity and action you no know? uh, human agency must co up culture to make an alternative future happen so we're not bound to take uh, to to the culture that we create we we're we're sort of bound to it because we abide by it. We agree to be in one culture. We to follow what we create. But ultimately, the final ar arbiters of culture are people. Okay, so the revolution, whether it be uh, the fourth industrial revolution or you know the kind of revolution we need right now, no, in in the country, it it really needs people. It won't happen by a Facebook. It won't happen by uh, uh, the social media. So what did these historical events accomplish? No, I don't think they were real revolutions, no? although they were called revolutions by the ones who created them or uh, advocated for them. But they were changed through coercion and violence. And we don't want that. No, Anything that's just imposing things on us and we're not given the chance to choose no? uh, things that are more appropriate for the kind of life that we live is actually an act of violence and that's not very creative. So what should education accomplish? Collaborative learning, informed options, and creative opportunities. Uh, these are very important things that uh, education should have no, structurally. If you want our education no, to, to really have an impact on the kind of 
creativity that we need to have in the future, then we need collaborative learning, informed options, and creative opportunities. Uh, so what should a smart city accomplish then? It's the same, no? The smart city should be collaborative. It should uh, give us informed options, and it should give us uh, creative opportunities. Right. So... Um, uh, so now, uh, I'd like to present the assertion that we were not born with these conditions, so we have to make them. Now, for collaborative learning to happen, for, for us to have informed options, and for us to have creative opportunities, we have to create these things no, to happen. And we have to make it happen through education. No? From the point of view of culture, education is the means by which culture is transmitted or um, passed on from one generation to the next. So uh, it should be a value. No? These things should be values for us, and we need to embed it in that kind of education we have. Now, uh, education is a construct. We all make the kind of education. So the kind of education we have is the product of creativity itself. If we have a dumbed-down ed education, it only comes from a dumbed-down creativity that, that that particular education is sort of facilitating or forming in students. Okay, and all, all humans are, of course, creative, and we see this all the time in children. I don't know if you've uh, encountered the word hack schooling. Uh, hack schooling is now happening in the U.S., and they're allowing children to, like, choose no, certain things that they want to learn it's not um, imposed on them, and they trust that the child will ultimately make the, the right decision given the kind of values that are uh, <clears throat> passed on to them by the older generation, you know, the, their parents and their adult members of the family. Um, this is the kind of education we get uh, that elevates or brings down creativity if, no, <clears throat> uh, if the, the kind of education that we have is really not allowing children to be empowered, then it, it does not elevate education. It only brings it down. So we have to look at it. Now we have to look at hack schooling. Maybe it's a way of trying to repair what we have uh, done or undone you know, with the kind of education we have. So I did the research on HIV AIDS advocates and uh, I, I had some findings. I'd like to share it with you because uh, that, that research was something that had to do with the use of digitized technology, no? and uh, once using that were advocates of HIV AIDS. So I learned that no? these advocates are very much into the use of digitized technology, understood very well four concepts. No? Number one, human complexity. They understand how complex uh, the human condition is, the value of connectedness. So they were very much networked. Uh, they also see the value of calling for change because change will not happen no? well, if we just sit and wait. And then, of course, they also understand that there that that there are certain body of knowledge that cannot be just transmitted as is. They have to process it in creative ways so that it becomes more useful to a lot more people. And of course, they also learned that uh, these advocates are uh, well connected to the academe, to professionals, to government, and advocacy groups. So when I was trying to bring together all the findings from this research, I realized that. For us to, you know, produce all of these HIV AIDS advocates who are very much active in trying to solve the HIV problem from a social perspective, we need to have people who have these ideas and also have these networks no, taught to them or brought to them while they are in school because students will not learn it on their own, especially after college. So they have to be, they have to be introduced to it early in their lives. Of course, and... Uh, these, these advocates also had access to clay. When I say clay, these are creative tools, learning content, advocacy platforms, and youth engagement. No, their education had these characteristic uh, uh, tools no, or, or uh, components. And they're the ones trying to make the most out of what's available out there now because of the digital technology that's accessible to a lot of us. Okay, now you will see here that I, I just presented to you, Clay. Now, I, I remember when I was a child, I was fascinated by Lego, and it seems to function like clay. You know, we're allowed to build you know, using bricks. Pixels are the building blocks of digitization. 
So images are put together via the pixels. Now, if you think about it, no, it seems like there is a transformation in the kind of material that we use uh, in our creative no, processes. Um, but, you know, even as even if they're like proxies of each other taking on a different level no, uh, for a particular age no, in our lifetime, they're actually very imperfect analogies. No? Uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, use the Lego to substitute for clay or even pixels to, to be the uh, perfect analogy for a Lego set or a, a clay no, material. Uh, a little bit of flashback, no? when I was a kid, I remember in Cubao, my mother took me there to her work, and then I cried no, very hard because I wanted the matchbox and my mom couldn't give it, couldn't give it to me. And now we see a lot of toys in Divisoria, and you know, every child could probably buy one for himself. And uh, I'm presenting this to you because seemingly now there's no dirt in toys, and anyone can just have any toy uh, a child would want. Um, which was very, very different from where I was. Uh, and I still remember when I was playing with my friends you know, in grade school, um, we didn't have the, the match boxes. So what we did was we played with our, our cars, you know, the gifts that we had during Christmas, and we dressed it up. We, we made different versions of the jeepney. So each of my friends would have their own dressed up jeepneys. So now... Uh, Parallel, no? you have your dressed up Barbies and you have your just up jeans. Uh, but technically, you won't be able to do these things without the material, no? which is the Barbie or your jeans. And these are economically determined. No? Some, some people will not be able to afford it. Some people will. But that just tells us that creativity is, is not free anymore. No? It, it will have to be bound to some form of economic uh, practice. So Mythbuster Challenge. So a lot of us were taught necessity is the mother of invention. No, uh, or is it really? Or is deprivation the mother of invention? Because that was my experience. I didn't have those toys, therefore we made them. Or is desire the mother of invention? So what's the answer? No. The answer is A, a for a lot of people. But actually, the answer there is C. C, desire is the mother of invention. No, if there's no will to innovate or to invent, there's nothing. No, in fact, you see that there were many inventions that didn't really have any any conti continuity in the development because some people willed it, but it never really became a, a piece of artifact that society really benefited from. So I my my position here is it is desire that is the mother of invention. So now we see that technologies have barriers to entry. Um, it's not very easy now to be creative, uh, especially that we're attaching a lot of creativity to technology. No, uh, a lot of a lot of kids are feeling sad because they can't have an iPad, they can't have a laptop, they can't have a mobile phone. It seems like creativity is bound to the technologies that are now present and mainstream, which is sad. Uh, and technologies have barriers to creativity as well. No? Uh, technologies have become barriers to creativity too. Uh, let me just share to you uh, what I did in the past. No, I actually built a clay house. Um, it, it's called the Cub House. And um, it's like a, it's a big, small toy for a big boy like me. I completed the whole thing. And uh, I spent um, less than half of what people will spend for a, a, a regular house. But I'm presenting this to you because, you know, creativity doesn't have to be limited to what is standard now. They practically, practically made uh, construction standardized at this point in time. So there's no room for any clay house anymore in the urban centers. But I was so happy when I made one in the rural, you know, in the rural area. Uh, but uh, sad to say, you no, know, that hasn't been um, continuous because of the situation that I'm in. But... I'm presenting this to you because what I'm saying is creativity should not be limited by the technologies that are made available for us. No, we can move it around. So are there barriers to creativity? We all know now, no? So are there barriers to creativity, especially that people are learning online, uh, online classes? Are, they, are the students less creative now because they're bound to technology? No, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us 
we have heard no a lot of complaints about um, online classes not being uh, open enough for creative activities no and this is a quite a sad situation but the thing is uh, you're you're lucky if you have your laptop you have your internet connectivity you'll probably have the opportunity to be creative in the contemporary no uh, idea what innovation and creativity is it's attached to the technology what happens to you if you're a student who doesn't have a laptop and you're being asked to be creative no in class you're basically uh, marginalized by the whole thing right so again uh, I'm putting this no again in front of you. I'm pushing for the idea that um, knowing where we are right now, uh, we know there's deprivation. We know that there is necessity. But what do you think will be the starting point of innovation in the area of online learning? It's going to be desire. No? Technology seemingly is not giving us a solution. Uh, despite the fact that we need online connectivity that's really you know, fast and quick, no? Uh, they're not giving us anything. It's it's not getting faster. So there's no solution being given to us by the sectors no, and technology sectors. Now, human agency, desire for change is creativity. Um, we must have the capacity to imagine an alternative future and to mobilize towards its fulfillment. So it starts from us. It, we have to envision the kind of creativity we want no if if we're limited to the creativity that's bound to technology then that's all we will get and poor kids who don't have these gadgets they won't ever they won't ever find themselves at par with students who learn using these technologies and that's very sad because as i mentioned clay it's 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 the it's the potential no that's not being used no because we always equate uh, creativity with okay the pixel no no longer with clay no longer with uh, the lego set lego is still not accessible even at this time no for a lot of kids so what what happened to the clay no so how are we going to work around online classes should we work around it like as if we're playing with clay or should we work with pre-existing models of how to do it or should we follow the road of digitization where you know the pixel is the way to go you know, when it comes to creativity uh is is the clay going to be destroyed at some point no I, i'm bringing this picture to everyone because i think there's uh there was a debate in the past when tv was just beginning you no know, is the radio going to disappear you no know? that was the question because tv was so engaging but as of now we all see radio is no longer uh the same radio has in fact evolved you no know? radio has incorporated tv no within itself so teleradio no did 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 tv eat the radio or did the radio eat the tv no but regardless of what the answer is i guess what i'm pointing at is things will not disappear if there is still a need for them if they remain valuable right so know your tools to make it work for you so if you don't know the basic tools how can you ever make it work to your advantage no if all you know is your computer, how will you make the other tools work for you? No, it won't be able to compensate for the inequity that's in education because we all know there's a barrier to the use of gadgets no, when it comes to creativity. Now, I'd like to go back to my past. No, uh, I'm bringing this all uh, in front and center because I think what made me creative was my interdisciplinary education. I can see things from different perspectives and I know that if one doesn't work, I still have another way of looking at the problem and make solutions out of that particular perspective that I'm using. Okay, and I'm also look uh, presenting these two pictures. You have a big school no, in the West, no, uh, seemingly the most important school no, or the one of the better schools no, all over the world. And on the other hand, you have the little grade school or the the preschool no school very small uh, which do you think has more innovation traffic no between the two setups which is the more interdisciplinary where do the learners learn more no in terms of the crossing of knowledge and the crossing of interests it's not going to be in the big institutions big institutions will excel in expertise making it will not be on interdisciplinary education because given the structures built by these 
big big schools it will be very hard to go outside of those structures the silos will remain so there's going to be a um, uh, greater effort needed for them to move out of those silos so smaller schools will probably be at a an, an advantage now because we need innovation but the challenge will be in resources because a lot of the changes we want will require resources that small institutions may not possibly have right so uh, an example of a problem solving uh, situation that we did no, in St. Paul, uh, we wanted to move forward when it comes to pushing for technology advancement in our students. And at the beginning, we all know there are only a few schools who can leverage technology, especially the ones who have high capital investment in computers. You know, Benilde is one of them, STI, a AMA would be these schools. You know? um, but we said we, we shouldn't we shouldn't um, make these uh, barriers become our problem. We should go around it. So what we did was we tried to collaborate with a small institution that was very forward-looking when it comes to innovation. So we did that, and instead of making new majors no, in, uh, in the university, we mainstreamed digitization skills or uh, creative um, skills in the use of digital technologies in the general education so regardless of whether they um, graduate from computer courses or you know digitized uh, courses they all have the skill to work in a digital working environment but then the pandemic happened and now the the very technology that we acquired is no longer usable it's there in the school but the teachers are no longer around so you need to be creative now and we realize that technology dependence is really unjust okay so we need creativity to be just we need technology to be just so we go back to clay no clay literally clay and the clay that i uh, presented to you the acronym clay so we start with human agency with agency the capacity we need people to desire something new and hopefully come together as people desiring the same thing to come up with change Right? And therefore, I go back to Clay, creative tools, learning content, advocacy platforms, particularly for creating a lot of change. And of course, we need to engage a lot of the youth because we need critical mass to, to produce change. So how do we innovate education to produce greater innovation? We close the loop. So we, we go back to the Lego, we go back to the Clay, and from the Clay, we go to your pixels. And putting all these things together will give us a lot of options. No, we we will begin to see the teleradio all over again. No, where where no particular technology is defeated, only creativity uh, abounds. So you can only close the loop, however, if you see that there is a gap that needs to be filled. So if you don't see that there is a gap, you won't do anything about it. And if you have the agency, the desire, and collaborators. To restore creativity back into the system because uh, 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 a scholar in the UK said we've all dumbed down our education and creativity seems to be nowhere anymore so we need to to reinvent uh, education so that creativity comes back so let's examine education from a creative person's lens because otherwise it will all be just about structures and models tried and tested but never creative you no know? uh they're just they're just bricks you can put things around but you'll never form a new new thing no, out of it okay so my final question is which cyborg are you uh, i learned about the cyborg in um uh, uh, cybernetics no uh are you a creative extension of your tools or are you the creative person behind all tools okay what is education teaching you about you so I go back to the question, is uh, education teaching you technological determinism or is it teaching you cultural determinism? If you want creativity, then maybe we should enrich culture and uh, culture will enrich the kind of creativity we have. So that's digitization and innovation in creative education from my end. So I hope that we all move forward and I hope that uh, at this time you all realize that there's no one way to creative education, there are people who will push for the technological deterministic um, 
digitization and innovation. And there will be people like us no, in St. Paul who want to be more culturally appropriate and responsive, no? making creativity uh, a product of human agency and decision making rather than just an acceptance of available technology given to us by uh, sectors that's more involved in uh, earning no? profit from the technologies they, they produce. All right, so I think that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope that uh, I was able to clarify certain issues. Thank you. Okay, two, uh, three questions. On so, number one, K to twelve is not an innovation. K to twelve has been around. We're just lagging behind people who have already taken that route. But K to twelve is something that is uh, still different from the way Finland no, is doing education. Right now in Finland, uh, they're taking away the the subjects. No, what they're doing is incorporating all the subjects in a topic. So they learn uh, European Union no, in class, and there you will have geography, you will have math, you will have sciences, all embedded no, in European Union. So that, I think, is more innovative than K-12. But what can we do if, if we're enslaved to the idea that we cannot be acknowledged as quality education without grade 11 and 12? So it's a globalization impacting on us. And for you know, whatever reason, no, there's really great um, demand for us to be able to qualify for the requirements of, of education in other uh, countries because our main, our main exports are really human resources, right? So you want Filipinos to be profitable no? outside of the Philippines. You want them to earn more money. You want Filipinos to generate a lot more income from our migrant workers. I, I see that as economically determined, no? And, you know, there's no turning back. K to 12 is here. And I think based on what I saw now from my students, uh, a lot of the K to 12 uh, graduates, no? Grade 11 and 12 graduates that we have in St. Paul are really very much empowered by the, the two years extra that they have. Um, and that said, no? Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that the motivation behind K to 12 is different the actual output of K to 12 is also a different issue altogether. So if you ask me additional additional years for it would be good, no? But the way you design that additional two years would be also very critical. And at this point, we're just adjusting to what the, the structures that have been created for us. Now, the second question is, is it something creative and innovative? We have to see, no? We, we're, it's still going to be developed no, in the coming years. We're barely into the third year, I think. We haven't been into the K-12 for five years. So it's very premature to, to scrap it or to review it. It's still very early. Uh, for now, there's a lot of opportunity to innovate. And we're, we're trying to find opportunities to really do that, at least in St. Paul. And then the third question, how do we marry hack schooling to the traditional way? And how we look at learning? Our traditional way kasi, is not really traditional in the sense of it's indigenous to us. It's really American system. So the traditional way is really an American way for, for us. Now, hack schooling is also hacking the American system. So when we say, how do we marry hack schooling in the traditional way? It's actually being done now in the U.S. Now, the thing, the challenge is how do we find our, our unique hacking of the kind of education that we're producing here in in uh in the philippines because the hacking there is appropriate there the hacking for us will have to be appropriate for us so you'll need people to look at the traditional way see where we're going to be in the future and then try to figure out how to bridge the two and that's not going to be easy you'll need really 
quick thinking and very um, like uh, imaginative people to think of new ways to do it no, without being um, determined mainly by the economic and political forces outside of the country. Right. Thank you. Oh, there's another Very question. Okay, now, we have another question from the Bloggers uh -huh. Academy, the content creators have. Is there any tool that you can share, Dr. Brian, on how we can measure creativity in the education? And how do we know whether we're doing better or not from the education perspective? Okay, first question. Is there any tool? Measure. There, uh -uh. It, I will not advise having only one tool. Because for me, Creativity is culture bound. When I say culture bound, every school should have a way of generating creativity you know, out of the students, depending on the kind of values that they have and the kind of mission that they have. Say, for example, in St. Paul, our our um, our founders were really into healthcare, education, and pastoral work. So our creativity has to address that that mission of no, the institution. And Chad wants this to happen too. And it's not bad. But what I'm saying is if you want a certain direction for your creativity, then the measure measuring instrument should also be geared towards the kind of output you want. And with OBE, no, the kind of output should be a determinant of the measure. Okay? So what I'm saying now is yes, you can make your own, but please don't use another person's measuring instrument because definitely their output will not be yours. Uh, your institution will have a different kind of priority. Your institution will respond to a different kind of social need. And the output should be responsive to the social challenges no, that will face the students. Now, for the second question, how do we know whether we're doing better or not from creativity and innovation perspective? You're only going to know if you, you have targets. No? So first thing is, you know your mission, that's your past. You know your future, how do you want to be responsive? responsible for the future what's your output there right so once you have an idea of what the output should be you go back to your students what do they have because design thinking is like that you go back to empathy you go back to understanding your natural resources because even if you don't uh, even if you know your your mission no it's an institutional thing even if you know where you want to be it's a target no it's it's forward looking it's prediction it's for forecasting at the end of the day, you're not going to make it without your students. So your seed is really the student. Start from there, figure out what they have, and see how you can let them grow given the kind of structures you have in school. But definitely, regarding this question, you'll need to know what you want in the end so that you'll know if you're going that direction. Otherwise, you'll, it will just be a hit and miss. So find your, find your target first. And then once you have the target, you know if you hit it or you don't. Oh, okay. This is interesting. Should I answer this? Yeah, the Vloggers uh, Academy also. The future. What is the future that you're seeing and how we view learning? Mm, okay, that's a difficult question. That is a good question. Um, there are many futures, no? Um, I think... Your uh, future view of learning. Yeah, I think there should be not one. There should not be one future. Of learning uh why am i saying this because education should be responsive to the social context where they they are found so if we're looking at the provinces in a very agricultural setting the 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 future of learning should be different there compared to the urban setting the urban setting would have different needs it has different resources and therefore the targets should be different and knowing that education should be responsive socially no, to the challenges of the people no, that support that kind of education, then no, the learning appropriate to that particular location should be the one pursuit. So my, my idea is a more diversified future, diversified futures for Philippine education, not just one. For now, what I see, that ed, one direction, go there, pluck, herd mentality. Um, siguro in basic ed, that's fine. But in, in, in college, no, uh, older students have, uh, have capacities to make their own decisions. Let them, empower them, and allow that to direct the kind of 
a future you know, that we will have uh, in, in the area of education and creativity. Because at the end of the day, the future of education will be in the hands of those we graduate you know, from our school. So if we keep producing the kind of minions that we have, then you won't have a different future at the end. I hope I answered the question. Yes, do you have any questions? Okay, do you have any more questions from our participants? Okay, seeing none and hearing none, we can move to the next flow of this structure. May I present the certificate of uh, prior to that at this juncture, we would like our participants to please um, evaluate the, you know, this is the consent form QR code. And you can also check the email for the link of our evaluation. And I, if I may, our speaker, yeah. participants during the digitization and creative education on February 26th, the Philippine Society for Quality Awards this certificate of a priest to Dr. Bryant is Bantugan. Thank you. Also, all our participants will be given e-certificates. Our secretariat will get in touch with you. And at this point, may I present to you the Philippine Society for Qualities Activities for 2021. True to its vision, PSQ is continuously providing relevant activities which are responsive to the needs of the industries. And we have invited renowned quality gurus throughout the years. We have partnered with different local and organizations for collaborative projects which will benefit our members. PQ, a, PQ, PSQ also facilitates the highest national recognition for exemplary organizational performance of private and public organizations in the country, known as the Philippine Quality Award. We also promote quality awareness and practices in both private and public sectors, and also we also encourage the development of members in the areas of quality leadership and technology. In so doing, we recognize different companies and organizations. And we also like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to your networks to please attend the training activities flashed on your screen. These are the activities organized by the, by the society for this 2021. So if you're interested, please get in touch. Our diet or your visit, or please visit our website www.q.org.ph for more details. And we are looking forward to seeing you again on the various activities laid down by the society. And you can reach the Philippine Society for Quality via social media. Please visit and like this different sites to be updated of our activities. And we have come to an end of our webinar this afternoon. Thank you very much to all of you here especially to the participants and to our resource speaker. Again, a warm virtual applause to our speaker, Dr. Ryan Batagan. And this has, this has been your host, Dr. Zandra Maningas, the Vice President for Branding and Marketing of the Philippine Society for Quality, saying thank you.